My soul longs for you should be the reaction and the response of our hearts towards God. Did you hear what I said? Whenever you are a child of God, you've been made new by Christ. He's put a new heart within you. Then the natural thing that should be happening in your life is that your soul should long for God. It isn't something you need to conjure up. It isn't something that you need to say, man, I tell you, I need to mark on my my record that I read the Bible or I spent time with God. And I know that I ought to do it because I feel guilty in my heart. That's not it at all. There should be a longing in your heart for God. To know Him, to spend time with Him, to walk with Him, to fellowship with Him. Now, if there's not, that doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. It could mean that you're not a Christian. Non-believers usually don't have a longing for God. Matter of fact, they run away from God. So if you're not a Christian, you're not going to have a longing for God. But just because you don't have a longing for God doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. But what it does mean and can mean is that you in your life, as you've lived, you have allowed sin to build up in your heart and your life. You've done some things, failed to do some things, and you've let this sin build up in your life to where you no longer have that longing for God. You no longer have that hungering and thirsting for God. And if you're sitting there today, and you say, boy, I really don't have that longing. My soul does not long for God like it once did. Then you need to hear what we're talking about today, here in the life of David, and we'll be focusing on Psalm 51, about getting and how to have a clean heart. Now let me just put an asterisk by that for you if you're taking notes. Don't look around saying, boy, I wonder who's got that, who's been through that. I wonder who's doing it. Let me tell you who's been there. You have. All of us have been there at times in our journey. We've been at a place where we didn't long for God. In our journey, we've been at a place where we let sin built up in our life. And if you're there now, you don't have to be there. You don't have to be there. You know why? Because the second part of that song, it says, God makes all things new. Now, that didn't just happen in salvation. You know what? God makes all things new Daily in your life. Daily in your life. He will cleanse you. He will, as David says here in a moment, he'll create in you a a clean heart, a fresh heart and renew a steadfast spirit within you. That's a work that God will do in your life. All you have to do is to confess it. And if you confess that sin, God removes that sin, casts it in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, He makes you new, and you know what happens? You'll find that you once again have a longing for God in your heart. A longing for God. Well, last week, we saw the fact that Nathan, that prophet, came and confronted David about his sin. He told him the story, remember, about the rich man who had so many things and the poor man who had just a ewe lamb. And uh, he went, the rich man, when he had a traveler come by, was unwilling to take of his flock, but went and took of that poor man's ewe lamb and killed it and fed the traveler. And David became so mad and said, Why did he do that? Who is this man? He deserves to die. He must make restitution. He has no compassion. And Nathan said, You are the man. You're the man who did that. You committed sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. You are the man who sinned. And then he began to detail to him how he had sinned in his life. And this is what it says there in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 13. This is what David's response was. Then David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Now that's just one sentence, one statement. It seems like that's all he said, but that's not all that he said. That's not all that he said. That's a summary statement that he makes confession. He is repenting of his sin. He realizes he's done something that's wrong. But that's not all that he said. He reveals to us the steps of repentance. He reveals to us the means of confession. He reveals to us how to move back into a right relationship with a holy God. And God wants us to know that, and God wanted us to know it so much that He put it in His Word. It's it's in Psalm 51. Turn to Psalm 51. We'll be focused there today. Psalm 51, the entire psalm, deals with this matter of the confession of David's sin when he had committed sin against Bathsheba, Uriah, and ultimately and foremost, God. What does he say, and how does he get right with God? Now, stop there for just a minute. Because I want you to take a note in your heart, in your mind. We need to learn how to repent. 
And we need to learn how to confess our sin. Do you understand that? I want to stop there a minute and let you think about that. We need to learn how to repent, and we need to learn how to confess our sin. Now, why would I say that to you? Because I think whenever we were children, we learned this little prayer that we pray, and we'll say it over and over again, but I think we forget all about what it really means when we confess our sin. This is what we say. God, forgive us of all of our sins. You taught to pray that? And God, forgive us of all of our sins. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of you or me in the midst of that, but let me tell you something. If you ball it all up and you're just saying, God, just forgive me of all my sin, you're not very serious about that sin. Do you know how you commit sin? Let me tell you how you commit it. One at a time. One at a time. Do you know how you need to confess your sin? You are a smart group. Man, these, I, I appreciate it. One at a time. Oh, Brother Mac, why would I do it one at a time? Let me tell you what. If you want to stop your sinning, if you want to put a hindrance to your sin, and you want to think about it before you sin again, you just start confessing it one at a time. When you ball them all up together and say, God, forgive me of all my sin, you're never going to see any growth. You're never going to see any change because all you're doing is balling it up and saying, God, just forgive me if I happen to mess up. I really don't think I did. But in case I did, and I want to be in right standing, forgive me of all. That's not the way you do it. And when David said, I have sinned against the Lord, that's not all he said. He spends time with God. And he reveals to us the steps of repentance. There are three steps to repentance that I'm going to share with you today. Before we see those steps of repentance, I want, to see, I want you to see his introduction to God and what he says to God in Psalm 51. Listen to what he says. Verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the greatness of thy compassion, Blot out my transgression. Now, here's what he says. His first words to God is he says, God, I want you to be gracious, and not only gracious, I want you to be merciful to me. That's what he's saying. I want you to be gracious to me. Show me grace. Give me something that I had never worked for, I could never deserve. But he's also going to ask for mercy because he's going to ask God not to punish him for something that he does deserve. You understand? Grace is asking God to give you something you'll never be able to earn. And mercy is asking God not to give you what you deserve. Not to give that punishment that you outrightly deserve. Well, here's what he says. God, I want you to be gracious to me. I want you to show me mercy. And here's what he says. According to... Now, that is a great phrase. You need to circle that phrase in your Bible. According to... What? According to... Thy loving kindness and according to the greatness of thy compassion. Here's the reason that that word is so important. If somebody gives you something according to, it means it's in proportion to what they have. You understand? Let me give you an example of that. If somebody came along who was a millionaire and they wanted to give you out of what they had, Okay, they give you out, they could give you a nickel. They could give you a nickel and they have given to you out of their wealth, out of what they possess. But if they were to give you a nickel out of their multi millions, they would not be giving according to, but only out of, because according to means that it has a relationship to what is possessed. According to means if you've got a lot, I want a lot. If you've got a little, then I'll take just a little. But I'm asking for you to give me in proportion to, in relationship to what you have. I don't want it just out of it. I want it according to it. And hear what David says? David says, God, I want you to give me according to thy loving kindness. And I want you to give me mercy and grace according to the greatness of thy compassion. In other words, he says, as loving as you are and loving and kind as you are, as great as your compassion is, I want you to minister to me according to that. And how much loving kindness does God have? 
Never ending. Never ending. How much compassion does God have? Unlimited. And so David's saying, boy, I want you to give me according to that unlimited, everlasting, loving kindness and compassion. God, that's what I need. That's what I'm asking for. Now, what does he ask? According to what? Loving kindness. That is a great word. It is one of the key words that describes the character of God. Did you know that? It is one of the key words that describes the character of God. And loving kindness is a precious word because it tells us something. It tells us what he's wanting God to do. Let me show you. Somebody can love somebody and never do a thing. Did you know that? Matter of fact, people will go all the time, Boy, I love you. You know I love you. Hey, I love you. Haven't done a thing. All they did is fill the air with, I love you. I don't really want love. I want loving kindness. There's a big difference because you know what? Loving kindness is love in action. It's not only that I love you, but I love you so much I'm going to show you a kindness. Give me that all day long. Amen? I want God's loving kindness. I don't want Him to just love me. I know He loves me, but I want Him to love me so much He's showing kindness to me. His loving kindness. It is such a great word. Turn in your Bibles there a minute to Psalm 136. I'll show you what the psalmist does. Psalm 136. See if you think it's an important trait. Here's what it says. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to God of gods for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for His loving kindness is everlasting. Do you catch some theme there? This means yes. This means no. Did y'all catch that? He kept saying over and over again what? His loving kindness is everlasting. His loving... And, and David says... Man, that loving kindness, I want you to give me a cord. I need your loving kindness. Not only that, I need compassion. Not passion, but compassion. It's a movement within your heart. It's an it's a, a initiative within your spirit that calls you to do something, to respond to something. And he says, God, I just need your loving kindness, and I need your compassion, and I need it according to all that you are and all that you have because I am in a mess. He needs all the loving kindness he can find. He needs all the compassion that God can muster because he is in a mess. He has messed up his life. He has messed up his testimony. He's messed up his ministry. He is a mess. And he says, God, I'm calling on you. God, I'm calling on you. I'm asking you to do something for me. Let me tell you, my friend, we need to learn how to appeal to God like that. Amen? Because David hasn't messed up his life any more than some of us have messed up ours. <laughs> we are in need of a loving kindness and compassion of God just like David was. Well, what does he do then? After he makes this appeal to God, he identifies... The steps to repentance. Let me give those three steps to you so that you can have them. We're going to look at two of them today. We'll look at the third one next week. The steps to repentance are this. First of all, there's contrition. Contrition, that means a sadness, a, a, a grieving within your heart and within your life. Contrition. That is so important that there's a grieving within our heart and within our life because we've sinned. The second thing is then confession. We confess that sin which has caused us to have grief in our heart. We confess it before God. Confession means to agree with God that we have sinned. And then the third thing we'll talk about next week is an amendment of life. An amendment of life. That means that I'm not going to be sad for what I'm doing and confess what I'm doing and go and do it again. It means this, that I'm sad for what I've done. I confess before God that it's not according to His will. And I'm going to turn and I'm going to amend my life and I'm going to walk a different direction. You get that? That's repentance. The word repent actually means to change direction. I'm going the wrong direction. I realize it. 
I'm sorry for it. I admit it. I'm going to turn. I'm going to change my life. God's in the life-changing business. That's what he's all about. He's the life-changing business. And, and at any point in time in your life, I don't mean, you say, well, I don't have any big sin. Oh, really? Let's start listening and let's find out whether we think that's big or not. All of those are big, aren't they? At any point in time in your life where you're walking contrary to the will of God, it's important to realize you're walking contrary to the will of God and change direction. If it might just be a little bitty thing, let me tell you, if it's just a little bitty thing, it's still important to God that you get it right. You understand? So he gives us the steps to repentance. Look what he says in verse uh, 1 and 2, following the last part of verse 1. According to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only I have sinned, and done what is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified when thou dost speak, and blameless when thou dost judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So what he said. First thing I want you to see is there in verse number 3. For I know my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Boy, that's a statement of his position where he had been. I know my sin. I realize my sin. My sin is ever before me. Let me tell you about whenever you have an opportunity to walk with God. You get saved. Jesus comes and lives in your heart and life. That's a miracle. Amen. The greatest thing that ever happens that Jesus comes and lives in your life by the Holy Spirit. That change happens in your life. You taste the kindness of the Lord. You taste the kindness of the Lord and you know what it is to be forgiven of sin. What a blessing to have that sin burden lifted off of your heart and off of your life. What a blessing. But wait a minute. That happens to you and then you walk in sin and you live like David. This man had God's spirit in his heart. He'd been in fellowship with God. He wrote the 23rd Psalm. He'd done so many awesome things. You knew the presence of God was in his life. But then he sins. And when he sins, his soul did not long after God anymore. And he had this burden in his heart that his sin was ever before him. His sin and the guilt of that sin was ever before him. And it radically changed his very demeanor of how he lived. He had a sadness within his spirit and a distance between him and his God. And he was in a state of misery. He was in a state of misery. Matter of fact, you need to write this down, okay? I'm telling you to write these things. You're going to need it. If not today, you will need it. The most miserable people in the world are not lost people. Do you understand that? Lost people are not miserable. They do not know what they're missing. They only live for what they've got and, and they think that's all there is for life. So they've never tasted the kindness of the Lord. The most miserable people in the world are saved people who've tasted the kindness of the Lord known what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, known and experienced the peace of God, and all of a sudden find themselves in unconfessed sin with a sin burden in their life pressing on them and their sin and the guilt of their sin being on them and they realize how different it is than what they had had before when they had walked with Jesus. That doesn't mean they're lost. It just means they're carrying a burden they shouldn't have to carry. It's already been under the blood. It's already paid for. Jesus died on the cross for it. But we have to confess it. And if we do not confess it, we are miserable. And so the most miserable people you will meet in life are believers who have lost that walk with God, lost that joy in their heart, and whose sin and guilt is ever before them. 
That's what David says. David says, my sin is before me. It is ever before me. It's pressing in on me. The guilt of my sin is there. Oh, he was miserable. He was miserable. In his, his statements about this, he says, verse 4, I have done evil in thy sight. Well, that's something. When's the last time you said about yourself? Think about it. I have done evil. When have you said that? This is what we say. I messed up. <laughs> messed up sounds a whole lot better than evil, doesn't it? I, I, I really messed up. He didn't say that. He says, I have done evil. He's broken in his heart. Matter of fact, I think he's a little bit surprised, even shocked, at what he did. Have you ever done that? Have you ever sinned in your life to the point that you don't even realize that same person's you? I mean, that sin has happened. He's like, man, who in the world, what in the world did I do that for? Why did I act that way? Why did I respond that way? Why did I choose to do that? I didn't, that's not me. That's not what I want. Have you ever done that? It's exactly where David was. He was in the midst of doing things he had never thought about doing, never imagined doing. He says, I have done evil. Like what else he says regarding it? Verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my in sin my mother conceived me. Now, that doesn't mean his mother was sinning when she conceived him. He says this, I realize that I was born in sin. I realize I'm a wretched sinner. It's not something I learned how to do. It's something I was born with. It's something I knew how to do. I came here doing it, and I've committed iniquity and sin. Even from my mother's womb, when I came forth, I was a sinner. Do you hear him saying that? Do you hear the contrition in his heart? Most of us never get to the point of contrition, therefore we never get to the point of repentance because we're all trying to defend our character. Whenever you come to contrition, you've got to throw your character and what you think about it out the door, you understand? Quit trying to defend yourself about how good you are. Get right. Admit who you are. Admit what you've done wrong. And God is willing to accept it. God never rejects an honest man or woman. Now, if you're going to play games and you're going to try to deceive God and yourself, God doesn't have a whole lot of time for you. But if you are honest, He will meet with you. And He will minister to you. You understand that? Just being honest. He already knows anyway. Contrition in His heart. A sadness within his spirit. I'm telling you, if you're going to repent, you've got to be sad. You've got to be broken over where you are and what you've done before Almighty God. He, he says this statement. It's kind of an unusual statement there in verse 4. Against thee, thee only, I have sinned. Now, does he think he didn't sin against Uriah when he killed him or Bathsheba? No. He knows he sinned against them. But what he's saying is, God, you're holy God. You're a God of loving kindness and compassion. You're a God who chose me. And the sin that I committed against you as as though I only sinned against you. What I did against anybody else was nothing because to sin against you is the most important thing of all. Have you thought about that lately? Sometimes we're more concerned about how our sin affects everybody else and we haven't even thought about God. Did you hear that? We're concerned that our sin affected our wife or our husband or our children or our job or something. Else. We've not even thought about how it, how it was before God. And God's the only one that really matters. He's holy. He's righteous. He's the compassionate, loving kindness of God. He's broken in his heart. Not only that, he says, I have contrition, but I am going to confess my sin. He confesses it by asking God to cleanse him. Look at verse 1 again. According to the greatness of thy compassion. Here's the first thing. Blot out my transgression. In verse 9 he repeats it over. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. The first thing he says about asking for confession, he says, God, I want you to blot it out. A, a better way to put that would be to erase without the ability to erase. Did y'all get that or is that too fast for y'all this morning? To erase without the ability to erase. Do you ever remember whenever you first started in school and whenever you made a mess 
on, on a misspelled a word or you made a mess on the paper and, and it was in ink and something like that. And, and what did you do? What did you do? This is what I did. You know, I just, I just marked it all out. You know, I didn't even want them to see what I had done. Now, they told us later, you don't mark it out like that. You just put one line through it. Not me. I'm marking it out. That's what it means to blot out. If you cannot erase, then it means to cover up to the point that it's not distinguished. And see, if it's written there, that sin is there. He says, I just want you to blot it out, God. Don't put a line through it. Blot the whole thing out. I don't want anybody to see it. I want you to blot it out. Take away as though it is not there anymore. No one could identify that sin. Blot out my transgression. Blot out my iniquity. Here's another thing he says. Verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. It says, wash as a launderer would wash. Now there's a big difference in how you wash laundry and how you wash your body. None of you get into a washing machine to take a bath, do you? No, of course you don't. Sometimes we've seen our kids, we have need to throw them in the washing machine to get them clean. There's a whole difference in how you do the washer versus being in the bath. Because your skin can't handle it. Any of you ever have any baseball players or softball players in your family? Raise your hand. Bless your hearts. How many of you know that you have to take and scrub all that red dirt out? And our team, of all things, they wanted to have white pants. There should never be white pants on a baseball field. They should be red, same color as that dirt. Saves you a lot of time. Man, to sit there and you take bleach and you take every... Everybody passes around the ball game. What's the latest thing you've gotten to get it out, right? Everybody wants to look like they're Mr. Clean, walked on the place, even though they've been dirt all day. How do you... Man, you rub that and scrub that and... Man, you... How would you like to do that to your body? If you'd like to try it, come over to my house. I'm good at scrubbing that stuff. I'll work on you. You couldn't handle it. Your skin would fall off your body. You know what he says? God, I don't need you to cleanse me by rinsing me. I don't need you to cleanse me like just a regular bath. I need you to wash me like the launderer washes. God, I'm so filthy of sin. I need for you to wash me and cleanse me. He's serious, isn't he? Old preacher used to say, God, we need to take us, we need to take you, you need to take us into your laundry room. You need to use a scrub board of heaven to make us right. I remember old preacher used to preach that. I'd be thinking that, man, scrub board of heaven. That's getting serious there. That's exactly, that's exactly what he was saying. What? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my iniquity. Over in verse 9, he says, and hide thy face from my sins. How, how many of you have children? that whenever something comes on the TV or something, they don't want to say, huh, they want to hide their face. I had to hide the face and hide the ears. Ah, don't talk, don't say that. You ever had those things? That's what he's actually saying to God. God, I just want you to put your hands, your holy hands over your holy eyes and don't look on me. Don't look on me. For why? For I have sinned against thee and done what is evil in thy sight. Thou art justified when thou dost speak, and blameless when thou dost judge. Behold, thou desired, verse 6, truth and the innermost part and the hidden part, thou wilt make me know wisdom. Here's what he says, verse 7. Here's what he says. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He says, God, you need to cleanse me. I've confessed it. I'm asking you, and you've got to cleanse me. Hyssop was used to take and to sprinkle the blood. To sprinkle the blood upon something to make it clean. To sprinkle the blood upon a leper when he was, when he was unclean to make him clean. And he says, God, I'm so wretched and I'm such a sinner. You've got to take the hyssop and the blood and you've got to cleanse me. It's going to take the sacrifice that cleanses me. The shedding of the blood... For the remission of sin is what cleanses me. He didn't know it, but he's talking about Jesus, amen? That Jesus will be the one who would cleanse him. He says, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Listen, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Did you know that snow is beautiful, isn't it? It's be a snowflake is beautiful. But did you know that every snowflake, 
every snowflake has one speck of dust in it. Did you know that? Next time you see snow, I want you to go take it and look and find that dust. Every snowflake has one speck of dust in it. You know what he says? God, I don't want there to be a speck of dust of sin in me. I want to be clean. I want to be cleansed. I want to be right. And here's the result. Make me to hear joy and gladness and let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. God, I want you to renew me. I want to come back to that joy and that rejoicing that I had. The bones that you have broken, the bones of my spirit that you've broken, the pain of my life, God, let them be a source of rejoicing. Let them be a source of rejoicing. Did did you know that sometimes we only understand the grace and mercy of God whenever God puts us back together? when he's put us back together. You know the depth of his love because you know the depth that he had to go down to pick you up, to bring you out. And he says, God, I want to rejoice again. God, I want you to put me together again. God, I confess I need you to do this in my life. If you're serious about your sin, if you want to walk in purity, and holiness, and the power of God, if you want your soul to long for God, then you're going to have to repent of your sin, have contrition over that sin, a brokenness about that sin, a confession before God, and allow God to restore you. And then when he restores you, we'll see next week, there's an amendment of life. He says, I'm going to change God. I'm going to do something different, God, than what I've been doing. I'm going to walk with you, being obedient to you. I want to change. Sin's a serious matter. And whether you know it or not, it'll pull you down, take away your joy, take away that longing of your heart. You need to confess it in contrition of your heart through repentance and let God restore you.